we've spent the first part of this course talking about the replication cycle in, in cells and culture mostly. But of course, that's not how viruses exist and move in the wild. They infect hosts. They infect humans and other animals and insects and plants and so forth. So we're, for the rest of this course, we're going to talk about the interaction of viruses with their hosts. And there becomes obvious the essential problem that is for a virus to endure, for it to continue to exist, it has to be perpetuated from host to host. It has to move through a population. So what we do in the lab in a cell culture is totally meaningless for the existence of viruses in nature. Right? In nature, they must infect a host and move from one host to another. And there are lots of ways to do that, which we'll be talking about. Essentially, if a virus goes into a single host and hides there, it hasn't been successful because it can't spread to any other hosts. And we're going to talk about some viruses that do go in a host and hide there or become latent, as we call it, but periodically reactivate so that they can spread to another host. So remember this. Keep this in mind as we're discussing this for the next couple of weeks. Uh, the, the, the virus has to move from host to host. We'll start to explore that today. Now, I said in the first day of this course, we live and prosper in a cloud of viruses. I just love that because it's true, right? This room is full of them and so forth. But in fact, most infections don't have any consequence for us. We're infected continuously, um, but we're fine most of the time. In fact, all these viruses that are impinging on us from the air, from us touching surfaces, from us ingesting viruses, for the most part, most of these encounters end, end. they don't go anywhere. <clears throat> the virus doesn't even get into a cell. So the virus goes in the wrong place. We swallow a virus that's a respiratory virus. It's meant to replicate in the respiratory tract. So it's not going to replicate in the, in the gut. <coughs> Viruses may fall on our skin and become inactivated uh, and may never even proceed beyond the initial point of encounter. The virus may infect one or two cells, perhaps, and it ends there. So this happens all the time. Most encounters have end before they even get started. But many infections do proceed. Many viruses succeed at infecting a host, but they don't cause disease. And we call this an inapparent infection. And we know this happens because we can find antibodies to viruses in people who have not had disease. So the example that comes to my mind is polio virus in the heyday of polio. When we had polio in this country, they would do serological surveys, take blood from people, and look for antibodies against the virus. And they would find it in people who had never been paralyzed, clearly, or had never had any of the other symptoms associated with virus infection. So the presence of antibodies shows that inapparent infections occur. And that also tells you that in an in inapparent infection, the virus has entered, it has multiplied sufficiently to stimulate the adaptive response, which happens a couple weeks after infection. So you have a full-blown infection, but nothing happens. This is by far the most common result of a virus infection of a host, aside from nothing happening at all, that you get an inapparent infection. Yet, of course, the disease that occurs captures everyone's imagination. That's what we all focus on when we read the news and when we do our research. We focus on disease-causing uh, organisms. Here's an example of an inapparent infection, <clears throat> West Nile virus. This is a flavivirus. It's a plus-stranded RNA-containing virus with an icosahedral capsid surrounded by an envelope which has glycoproteins in it. These happen to be parallel to the membrane. See, all this stuff you know and you understand now as I'm telling you. It is a mosquito-borne virus discovered in 1947 in Uganda and never <coughs> present in the Western Hemisphere. It would cause infections in Africa, in the Middle East, but never in the Western Hemisphere. In 1999, in the summer of 1999, all of a sudden there were cases of West Nile encephalitis here in New York City. It first popped up in Queens and then spread throughout the city. And uh, by October, five years later, about one million people had been infected. We did serological surveys to ascertain that. 
and illness developed in only 20% of them. So we could say, okay, you have antibodies to West Nile, did you also have any illness? And you know, 20% of the people. So 80% of them were inapparently infected. And that has serious implications for public health, of course, because if you don't know that people are sick, it's hard to prevent spread of, of the infection. Also, uh, neuroinvasive illness, which is uh, rare, but happens with West Nile infection, happened in about 1% of these 20% of people. So that's just one example of an inapparent infection. It's of interest biologically, and this part of the reason is that not all hosts are the same. Some can fight an infection better than others or the disease that results. But the real key is that you can't stop epidemics very easily if most of the infections are inapparent. Now, just taking that to today, Ebola virus infections, there is a certain percentage of Ebola virus infections that are, that are inapparent. We don't actually know the number, but people have done serological surveys of remote villages in Africa and find people who are seropositive, and by that I mean have antibodies against Ebola virus, but they've never been ill. They would have known it if they'd had Ebola hemorrhagic fever. So even with a virus like that that has captured everyone's attention because it's so lethal, there are, there are inapparent infections as well. But as I said before, we focus on the disease outcomes. We focus on influenza, Ebola, hemorrhagic fever, measles, smallpox, polio. And that's because we want to try and prevent infection. So we're going to focus for the rest of this course mostly on virus-caused disease, how to prevent it, how we respond to it, why it happens, and, and questions like that. So we're, we'll talk a lot about pathogenesis, and pathogenesis means the process of producing a disease. Patho, you can probably guess, means disease, and genesis is the development of. And for viral pathogenesis, it's the virus. It can be bacterial pathogenesis, fungal pathogenesis, et cetera. And what I want you to understand at the outset is that <clears throat> when you have a viral infection and you have clinical symptoms, what we call the disease. It's not just the virus. The virus has a contribution, the replication has some contribution, but there is always a contribution of what the host does. We, may, we mount a very specific immune response and often that is entirely responsible for the symptoms of a disease um, and in most cases it's, it's part of the symptoms. So for example, for the past week I've had an upper tract respiratory infection which we call the common cold. I know this exactly what's going on, it hasn't gone below my sore throat. So I've had a runny nose, cough, um, sore throat. None of that has anything to do with what the virus is doing in me. It all has to do with my immune response. The cytokines that I'm producing uh, are all coursing through my system, and these are meant to clear the infection, but they're causing symptoms as well. And we will explore this for many different virus infections. In fact, there's some viruses that don't cause any pathology on their own. They don't kill cells, and they cause immune-mediated pathology only in an animal. We'll explore that in this course. So viral pathogenesis is where virology is today. All the stuff we talked about earlier in this course, the replication in cell culture. This was all figured out at the onset of virology and went through its golden years. Now it's harder and harder to do work in all those areas of the replication cycle. What people are interested in, and in part this has become, this is because funding of basic research has become politicized. How can you help us? How can you make us feel better and not get sick and so forth? So viral pathogenesis is hot and most labs who study viruses do pathogenesis. I have no objection to that. I love viral pathogenesis, but um, th there's still an awful lot to be done in other areas as well. So these are some of the questions we address in viral pathogenesis. We'll, we'll take care of some of these today in, in broad strokes. How does a virus get in the host? How does the host respond? We'll talk about that a bit later. Where does it replicate at the first onset of, of invasion? How does the virus spread? Uh, what parts of the host are infected? Um, is the infection cleared, or do you establish a lifelong persistent infection? We'll talk about those separately as well. And how is the virus transmitted to other hosts? This is very important because obviously if you don't transmit, you're not going to exist very long uh, as a virus.
So there are three requirements for a successful infection of a host. And by successful, I simply mean the virus getting in and replicating and producing more viruses, not necessarily producing disease, just getting in and replicating. So here's our host, uh, which you'll see several times uh, in today's talk. And it's not actually anatomically correct. You know, the respiratory tract is not actually connected to the alimentary tract, but this is the artist's license, as we say. And uh, what we need to start an infection, you have to have enough virus, first of all. We actually don't know what this is for most infections because we can't take human subjects and infect them with most viruses. You can't. That's not an ethical experiment. You can do it with a few viruses, like um, noroviruses that cause gastroenteritis. You can, in fact, it's very common to hire medical students and feed them norovirus. And um, we can't grow the virus in culture, so what we have to do is take diarrhea from people who are sick, filter it to remove bacteria, add something to make it taste better, a little color, and then you feed it to medical students. <laughs> and then they do this on Friday, and you get sick over the weekend, they study you, and then Monday you can go back to school, and you get $300 for that. So for those of you who are thinking of going to medical school, this is something you can look forward to. You can, you can, do, this, you can do this with rhinoviruses as well. Uh, and what they do is rhinoviruses cause a common cold, which is pretty benign. You put people in a room. Typically, you have them play cards, and you have one person who's infected. And you can, you can pipette virus in their nose to infect them. And then you can watch it spread, because the way the virus spreads is by people touching their nose. They get mucus on their fingers. And then if you're playing cards, you can understand how it's transmitted to another person. Because we, it turns out that we keep touching our eyes and noses all the time, and that's how we transmit infection. All right, but I digress. We don't know how much virus you need for most virus infections, but you need to have enough. We don't know how much for Ebola. And obviously, we can't figure that out, but this is a big issue these days. Next, you have to make sure the virus encounters cells that are accessible. Well, that makes sense. If they're not accessible to the virus, the virus won't infect them. But they also have to have receptors. They're susceptible to infection, and they have to be permissive. That the virus, even if it gets in, has to be able to replicate. And finally, the defenses that would normally inactivate the virus or prevent it from replicating have to be inactive or overwhelmed by the virus in some way. Because as I said, most of, our, most of the time our defenses can clear most infections. But for a successful infection to occur, uh, the defenses have to somehow be overcome. And sometimes that's simply by having a lot of virus inoculum. And other times it may be an overwhelming of the defenses. So let's talk about how viruses get in. Obviously, you, the virus needs to get into the host. Remarkably, we don't have all that many ways for viruses to enter us. We have a limited spectrum of entry sites for infection, and they're shown here. Uh, and they really fall into two or three areas. You've got your mucosal surfaces, respiratory, alimentary, urogenital tract. They all have mucosal cells, which are beautiful sites for viruses to get in. If we didn't have mucosa, we'd have a lot less virus infections. Unfortunately, we need these mucosal layers to absorb oxygen and, and food and get rid of wastes and so forth, so there's no getting around it. Our eye is a portal of infection. Uh, and our skin. Well, even though you'll see the skin is a great defense, we can injure ourselves, we can get bites, we can stick needles into ourselves. In fact, the fact is that most of our hands are cracked and amenable to viruses getting in. So limited sites of infection, mucosal layers are, are probably the most common. So let's start with the respiratory tract. Well, I guess we're starting with the skin. Uh, the skin, which is your biggest organ, right? It weighs the most of any other, uh, any other organ in your body, <clears throat> is a great barrier because the outer layer is dead. Your skin is composed of the epidermis and the dermis. And the epidermis has many different layers with these wonderful names here. And the, most outermo the outermost layer, which is darkly colored in this image, is dead. Because as you know, your skin develops from the, basement, the basal cells at the bottom. And they differentiate as they move up. Uh, and then they die 
and the top layer dies and it flakes off. So all the dust in the room is your dead skin. It's, in this room it's chalk, but in any other room if you take a glove and rub it on a surface and it comes up white, that's your skin. It's your dead skin that's always flaking off. Viruses can't replicate in that dead skin, right? Viruses need living cells. This is a great barrier to infection. Unfortunately, it's often breached. So I had this big argument with online people about Ebola infection. You can get Ebola by spilling virus on your hands, not if your hands aren't cracked or cut. And the rest of your body, which is not typically cracked or cut, if you pour the virus on it, you're not going to get infected because the virus cannot get through. But your hands are typically cracked. You usually have cuts around your cuticles and so forth. So if you get Ebola virus there, it's going to get into the underlying tissues and it will infect you. So there are many ways to breach this very nice barrier. Mosquitoes do it very nicely. So when they bite you, they have very long proboscis that goes down into the dermis, as you can see here. So the dermis is the layer below. The epidermis has living cells in it, and some viruses actually uh, replicate in those. The papillomaviruses, which you can get by a little scratch that you can't even see, can replicate uh, in the epidermis in the living cells. But mosquitoes deliver virus to the dermis, which has lots of uh, lymphatic vessels and immune cells and blood vessels, so viruses are very happy to get in there. Of course, needle sticks do the same thing and so forth. So the skin itself being dead, it has other defenses, it has low pH, it has microbicides that are produced by our commensal bacteria, which are antiviral as well. And so that protects us quite a bit, but there are cases when virus can get in. So what haven't I covered? Mosquito bites, needle sticks, cuts. Can you think of another way to get viruses in? You must, come on. Do you have pets? No? Nobody has a pet? Sorry? Licking? By a pet? Yeah. How about a bite? Uh, a dog bite. Rabies. Very common, right? So animal bites can spread viruses. Uh, raccoons, bats, they can all bite you and spread viruses through your skin. So skin isn't perfect. Mucosal surfaces respiratory tract, alimentary, et cetera. These are beautiful sites because, as I said, they have to be permeable, otherwise we don't live. Uh, and um, viruses can get in and out of them very readily. They're lined by living cells, they're wet, perfect for viruses to come in uh, and infect. So let's talk about some of these. The respiratory tract, we have to breathe. We're breathing, I think our respiration rate is like six liters a minute. We're taking in, we're sampling the air continuously. We're just pulling in all of these viruses and they land on the mucosal cells. Our respiratory tract from the top to the bottom is lined with these uh, mucosal epithelial cells. You can see in the diagram. Uh, they're polarized. They have an apical and a basal lateral domain. At the top, they're covered with a layer of mucus, which is made by these goblet cells. And the mucus is protective has antimicrobials in it. We have a mucociliary elevator, so the mucus is constantly pushed up. So if viruses do get in, some of the, many of them will get pushed up into your mouth and then you swallow your mucus. Yes, you all do, because you don't all spit it out every minute. And uh, then the viruses will get inactivated in your stomach. Below the, this layer of cells is a basement membrane, which is a great, it's not actually a membrane, but it's a, a, a chemical layer made up of of various long polymers that is a good barrier for things getting uh, below it. Nevertheless, viruses can infect throughout the tract. They can cause upper tract infections with different names depending on where the virus is replicating. Rhinitis, pharyngitis, laryngitis, and then we move further down, tracheitis, bronchitis, bronchiolitis, and bronchopneumonia. So rhinoviruses tend to be upper tract guys causing rhinitis. Influenza likes to do trachea and bronchi, but in the worst cases, it will get down into the alveoli. When viruses replicate in alveoli, then you get pneumonia, and this can be fatal. This is very bad. But you can see here some of the viruses that do upper and lower tracts. Some are exclusive to one or the other, and some can do both. So great portal of entry. I think most of the infections that we get come in through uh, the respiratory tract. Alimentary tract is another uh, part of us that's covered with uh, epithelial cells that are exposed. They don't have a dead covering to them. 
And this is particularly good for infections because, of course, we have to eat. We put things in our mouth and swallow them continuously, whether it be our fingers or food, and they're full of viruses. Did you know if you eat coleslaw, you're, at, you're eating like 10 to the 6 particles per gram of, cross, of coleslaw of an insect virus, which passes into your stomach and is inactivated because of the low pH the, of, the, of the stomach, the high pH of the intestine, the digestive enzymes, bile salts, and so forth. So it's very protected, but it's always moving, right? Your intestine, the, the, the food is moving around to help digest and absorb it, so that lets viruses contact the wall uh, as well. And of course, once viruses can replicate in the intestinal tract, they're shed in the feces, and that's how they can be transmitted to others, and we'll talk about that later. So here's a diagram of the intestinal mucosa on the bottom is the big picture. We have an epithelial cell sheet, uh, which is also polarized. There's a basement membrane, which you can see here. There's sub-epithelial tissues, which are vascularized and which viruses would like to get into, of course, so they can spread elsewhere. There's also a basement membrane. And here's is a, is a higher power view on the top showing the enterocytes. And scattered throughout the intestine are these cells called M cells. These, these are very thin cells, and their function is to sample the antigen contents of the intestine. So they're, they're, phago, they're endocytic, let's say. They take, they have, and often dendritic cells sit below them with their processes sticking through. Uh, and um, immune cells can traffic very close to them and get through that basement membrane, as you can see here. So that, allows viruses to enter. On the right is an electron micrograph of this M cell. You can see how it's much thinner than the surrounding enterocytes. And we have lymphocytes below it. And here is actually a number of virus particles binding to the M cell. The real viruses, for example, can actually enter through M cells because they're very endocytic. They take up antigen from the lumen. And so virus particles just catch your eye and get, get below and can get into the host. Uh, the urogenital tract is also a good portal of entry. It has its own protections. It has mucus. It has low pH. But typically, uh, papillomaviruses can, can enter the urogenital tract. These are sexually transmitted viruses, as is HIV. And quite often, uh, sexual activity will predispose you to virus infection because it creates abrasions in the mucosa, which allow uh, viruses to get in. Uh, next, we have the eye, which is shown here. And this has a limited set of tissues which can be infected. This is the, they're, they're shown with asterisks here. The conjunctiva, which is the membrane on the surface of your eyeball, and then the immediately below it tissue called the sclera. Those can be infected with a variety of viruses uh, of different sorts, which, some of which we'll talk about. And one of the results can be what is shown on the right, this subconjunctival bleed. The virus induces uh, bleeding, and so you have this red coloration of the white of your eye. And this can happen if you rub your, so normally your eye is well protected. You make lots of fluid to wash away particles. You're blinking all the time, and that clears away any particles that are present. But if you, if you have some grit in your eye and you rub it, you can scratch the conjunctival membranes, and that lets viruses get in. If you, sometimes ophthalmologists can inadvertently, inadvertently spread virus infections. They touch the uh, instruments to your eye that are not properly sanitized. Or a common way to get an eye infection is to go swimming in a hot tub that's not properly chlorinated. And you can get a lot of adenovirus infections this way, and they can cause bleeds like that. The outer layer of which of the following is dead but can still serve as a portal of virus entry, respiratory tract, alimentary tract, eye, skin, or urogenital tract. We're, we're approaching zero attendance in this course, right? <laughs> Wait, I'm not going to talk to myself. If no one's here one day, I'm not going to give the lecture. <laughs> so please, someone come. All right, um, what, how did we do? All right, oh, you got, a, got it right. All 25 of you got skin right. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. First, is that the first time ever? <laughs> okay. So vi we know how viruses can get in. Now they have to spread. Well, they don't have to, actually. Many viruses remain where they infect. So many respiratory viruses remain within the tract. And they're confined by the structure of the tract, by immune responses and so forth. But other viruses spread. And they can cause disease elsewhere. 
So, you know, respiratory viruses like rhinoviruses and influenza viruses, adenoviruses, will enter your tract and remain within it. They'll spread within the tract, but they won't go systemic. They won't go to other organs. So that's what we have here. You can have either localized infections or we can have disseminated systemic infections, which means the virus goes somewhere else. And to do so, they have to cross um, the, the barrier. They can infect these uh, epithelial cells and spread laterally right, among them, but they have to traverse the basement membrane. Uh, and, and they can do that. Some viruses can do that readily, and it's actually because of our immune response. We respond to infection by inducing inflammation. Inflammation is the production of cytokines and the influx of immune cells. And inflammation you know, is what gives you a fever and makes you feel terrible, flu-like symptoms. It's all an immune response. It can compromise this basement membrane. And so uh, viruses can get past it when inflammation occurs. Immune cells will be trafficking across the basement membrane, and the viruses can then get into underlying tissues. So here's an example of the gut. We have our M cell, which is quite thin, uh, and there are lymphocytes below it. If the virus infects the M cell and gets transported across it, then it has free access uh, into the underlying tissues through these gaps in which these uh, lymphocytes are, are moving, and they could also, the viruses could also infect the lymphocytes depending uh, on the particular virus. So even though there is a protective basement membrane, it can be breached either by picking a, a part like an M cell where it's very sparse or by inflammation which disrupts the basement membrane integrity naturally. Now the ability of a virus to spread also depends on where it's produced. So remember, many envelope viruses bud at the plasma membrane, right? Not all of them, some of them bud from internal membranes. but. <coughs> Cells lining the mucosal surfaces of our body are polarized. There's an apical and a basal lateral domain, which are chemically distinct. And some viruses bud at one or the other or both. So depending on where you bud off makes a big difference about how you spread. All right, so on the top, these are electron micrographs of viruses budding from polarized epithelial cell. At the top is influenza, which buds apically, not basal laterally. So this virus does not really uh, spread systemically all that often, but budding apically is great, right? Because now you're in the lumen of the respiratory tract, and when the, the host sneezes or coughs, they transmit the virus to someone else. Same with measles virus. Uh, measles virus buds apically, which is very good for it to be transmitted. It does not bud basolaterally. But vesicular stomatitis virus on the bottom is budding from the basolateral surface, and when you infect animals with this virus, the virus spreads systemically. So it's a, it's a requirement. In order to spread, you know, the virus has to get across the basement membrane, but if it's not budding at the bottom to begin with, it's not going to have much chance of doing that. Now, Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus related to measles virus. Meas these viruses bud apically. But and in mice, if you infect them with Sendai virus, the, the mice develop a respiratory infection and they shed virus you can make a mutation in the virus that affects the glycoprotein, so the virus only buds basolaterally, or in addition buds basolaterally. And when you affect mice with that virus, the virus now goes systemic. So just a simple matter of giving it the ability to bud from the bottom makes a big difference. I think that makes a lot of sense, and it's obviously important. All right, so let's say our virus has replicated in a body surface epithelium. It's managed to traverse the basement membrane. Now, once it's there, it's in the subepithelial tissues, we call them, which are highly vascularized, they can move around. And most viruses get taken up into the lymphatic capillaries. These are very permeable. They're everywhere, of course. And the, the virus then is, is moved through the lymph, lymph circulation, uh, through lymph nodes, and then uh, to um, the blood circulation, where they can then ha have access to any tissues. Viruses could also get into blood capillaries, of course, but uh, they're less permeable. Uh, than the lymph capillaries. And from there, the virus then goes everywhere. It takes a, a ride around the world because it's in the circulation. And that gives us what we call viremia, or virus in the blood. And this is an experiment in, in an animal where the animal was injected with a, a certain amount of virus, and then at different times after infection, the virus in the blood was measured by a plaque assay, for example, or some other assay. 
And so here you, we can see three distinct types of viremia. So when you first inject the animal, you have a spike of virus in the blood. That's passive. That's called passive. That's what you put in. It's simply the virus that you've inoculated. And then that virus goes to find its cell targets. And after two days or so, you have what we call a primary viremia because it's the first one that we're seeing. That's the injected virus that's replicating in tissues and now is producing virus in the blood. Uh, and then you have another burst of virus later on at about day eight or so after infection. We call this the secondary viremia. That's because the, the virus is initially produced, have found other organs, replicated in them, and has made more virus. Now, viremia is very important. In terms of pathogenesis, it lets virus spread to various places, which we'll talk about. It's important for diagnosing many virus infections. If you want to diagnose a number of viruses who are, who are present in the blood, you take a little bit of blood and you simply look for, for viruses. And we can do that for polio or HIV or a number of other viruses, but we wouldn't do it for flu. We wouldn't look for virus in the blood because it's not there. And finally, it's important for the blood supply. This is why we check every pint or every unit of blood that's donated for every virus that we know about, and we keep adding new ones. And you know, before 1981, we did not know that HIV was in the blood, and we transmitted infection to many people until we started checking for the virus in the blood. Uh, and so nowadays, we check for dozens and dozens of viruses uh, in the blood supply. The way viruses move from a mucosal surface to the blood and, and then to their final place is illustrated in this picture, which is the summary of, a, of work by an Australian virologist named Frank Fenner. And he studied a disease called mousepox. So it's related to smallpox virus of humans, but you can work with it in the laboratory safely. And mice normally get mousepox in the wild. Um, this is shed by mice, and as mice walk on whatever the, the ground, um, they get cuts on their foot pads, and the virus infects their foot pad. And so in the laboratory, you just infect the mice in the foot pad. This is one of the few animal models where the way you inoculate the, the mouse is actually similar to, to the way they acquire it in humans. So you, you put a little virus in the foot pad, so we start at the top here, and um, <clears throat> those little dots are virus particles. So you, you, you put a needle in the foot pad, you inoculate uh, the mice with a little bit of virus, uh, and then it multiplies in the skin, and then traverses the basement membrane, and enters the lymph, which you can see that the lymph is the green um, tube at the top. The virus is spreading into the lymph. There's a lymph node, and then gets into the blood. And that gives you a primary viremia. So the replication in the skin gives you enough virus so that you can detect in the blood. And then from the blood, uh, the virus goes into other organs like the spleen and the liver that are sites of virus replication. The virus grows there. It causes damage, which you could see if you take out the organs. And then the virus produced in those organs goes back into the blood, gives you a secondary viremia. So if you were measuring virus in the blood, you could see the two peaks of virus. And then that virus goes to the skin and causes the final uh, disease, which is a rash, which you can see here. Um, so it starts in the foot pad, it goes through the blood to various organs, and then back to the skin, and you get a rash. And many human infections are like this. They originate at a mucosal surface and go somewhere else uh, where they cause their disease. And measles is one of them. You inhale measles, it's a respiratory pathogen. It's into your blood, replicates in immune cells, and then eventually spreads to your skin where it causes a rash, very much like this one. So many viruses do this, and this is just a summary to show you that many infections start at mucosal surfaces, shown here. Uh, the viruses go from the lymph into the blood, uh, that, and that's your primary viremia. They can then seed various other organs, and it depends on the virus. No virus really tends to infect every organ, with few exceptions. Uh, multiplication then leads to a secondary viremia, and then the virus goes to various different target organs, depending on the virus, and um, that's where the disease is caused. So for example, poliovirus uh, ends up in the brain and spinal cord and causes paralysis, um, and some viruses end up in the lung and so forth. So this is a very common theme. You infect a mucosal surface, you go through a, a two stages of viremia, 
the second amplified by replication in a, in, a, in a secondary organ, and then the virus reaches the target in which disease is caused. Many virus infections have a rash as part of the disease syndrome, and uh, they, some of them are shown here. And rashes can be different. They look different, and this helps you to identify what's going on. They, here we have two different kinds of rash, which are called maculopapular, which is shown on the lower left. These are flat, red rashes, very typical, versus a vesicular rash on the lower right, where you can see there's, a, there's clearly fluid in these rashes, and the, uh, the skin is raised up to form these uh, raised areas. So we have a ver variety of viruses that can do this, Coxsackie virus, measles virus, the rash is very typical. Uh, parvoviruses, the little single-stranded DNA viruses. This is uh, an infection of young children. They acquire it by uh, respiratory route, and the virus ends up in the skin, just like measles. Same with rubella virus, German measles, and varicella zoster virus. When you're young and you acquire varicella zoster virus, you get chicken pox, and then the virus becomes latent in your nerves. And then many years later, it can reactivate as another skin infection that's caused shingles called shingles. <clears throat> All right, let's do another question here. In general, secondary viremia is a consequence of which of the following events? Secondary viremia. Viral replication in the bloodstream, viral replication at the original site of entry, viral replication in organs distal to the site of entry, viral replication in lymph nodes, all of the above. All right, 65% of you picked C, which is correct. Viral replication in organs distal to the site of entry. Um, it, so this is secondary viremia, remember, not primary. Uh, primary would be replication at the original site of entry, and none of you got that, which is good. Um, replication in the bloodstream. So technically that could be correct because it could be, uh, you know, you could consider that a lymphocyte is distal to the original site of entry, uh, but this C is more general and it, and it includes liver or spleen or any other organ that might be involved. Same with lymph nodes, you could consider lymph node to be um, a distal site, but it's not all of the above because B is wrong, so then it, that's why it's C. We talked about viruses moving uh, in the blood. Viruses can also move in nerves. And this is called neural spread, of course. And um, viruses can get in, uh, for example, at, at, in muscles. They can get into neuromuscular junction and spread to the spinal cord. Poliovirus does that. Um, rabies virus, you get an animal bite in a muscle. The virus moves up the nerve uh, into the spinal cord. <clears throat> viruses can also move the other way. So they can move anterograde or retrograde. They can initiate in the dorsal root ganglia. Herpes viruses are latent in the DRGs, and when you get reactivation in the production of new virus, they, they spread down the sensory nerve to uh, the sensory nerve ending, and that's where you get the fever blister or the cold sore. For some viruses, the invasion of the CNS is what their pathogenesis is all about, and that includes uh, herpes viruses and rabies virus. But for other viruses, it's an accident. And when we talk a little bit more about polio later, you'll see that when polio gets into the central nervous system, it, it's an accident because the virus can't spread from there. And that only happens rarely. Most of the time, the virus does other things. So virus movement in neurons is straightforward. And as I said, it can happen retrograde uh, or anterograde. Uh, virus can be taken up at a nerve ending. It moves along the axon by transport. The virus is attached to motor proteins. They're moved up the axon. They replicate in the cell body. They're shed. They spread transsynaptically to the next uh, axon and so forth until they get to the spinal cord, and it can go in the opposite direction of what, as well. So it's a series of infections and transmissions across uh, the synapse. Here's a great picture of neurons uh, infected with a herpes virus that carries a green fluorescent protein marker so you can visualize them. Uh, and you can see how the virus is in the, not only the cell bodies, but the axons and dendrites. In fact, you can use this to map neural circuits. People do this. You, just, you, can, you can stereotactically put virus in a specific part of a mouse or a rat's brain, 
And you can ask, what are all the connections? Because the viruses will trace the connections for you. And you can do this over time and, and uh, figure out what's connected to what. It's pretty neat. When we talk about CNS infections, there's some terminology that I will use, so you should be familiar with it. Neurotropic viruses can infect neural cells. It doesn't matter how they get to the CNS. It can get there by the blood or by neural roots. It doesn't matter. Neurotropic simply means um, that they can infect in neural cells. Neuroinvasive means that the virus can get into the CNS from somewhere else, whether you inject it in the muscle or into the blood. Can get in the CNS, it's neuroinvasive. Not all viruses are neuroinvasive. And neurovirulent means that the virus causes disease. So simply being neurotropic doesn't mean the virus will cause disease, it has to also be neurovirulent. So here are three examples of this herpes simplex virus. It has low neuroinvasiveness. So most of us get herpes simplex infections early in life, and most of us, the virus does not invade the central nervous system goes to the ganglia, which are outside of the CNS. But sometimes uh, people will get virus in the brain, and it causes a serious disease. So it's highly neurovirulent once it gets into the brain. We'll talk a little bit about why that is later on. Mumps is highly neuroinvasive. Now, we don't have much mumps left uh, in the world because of vaccines, but uh, when we did have a lot of mumps, about 50% of the children had virus in the brain, but they were fine because the, the virus is not neurovirulent at all. Uh, so high neuroinvasiveness, no neurovirulence. And rabies is the worst of both. It's highly neuroinvasive and highly neurovirulent. So you, get, you have an animal bite by a rabid dog. Chances are really, really good that the virus will get into your CNS because it enters the nerve endings in your muscle. It travels up the nerve to the brain or, or spinal cord. And then it's highly neurovirulent. Unless you're vaccinated, you will die. 100% fatality. That's, in my view, the most lethal virus, not any of the other ones that are out there. Almost 100%. Only a few people have survived rabies without being uh, immunized. All right, so now we have virus in the blood. How does it get into the tissue where it's going to replicate? We've talked about that happening, but how does it work? Well, tissues are different. They have different structures which have different permeabilities to virus infection. For example, on the left, in the, in the CNS, connective tissue, and muscles of certain types. Uh, the capillaries are made by endothelial cells. As you know, there's the nucleus of one of them. They're tightly joined together. There's a basement membrane around them, so it's really hard for viruses to get through. This is what we call the blood-brain barrier. In other tissues, like the, the kidney, pancreas, the ileum, and the colon, the uh, endothelial cells have pores, so that can let virus in. But they do have a basement membrane as well. And then in, in other tissues like the liver, um, the, the, the vessels are a joke. They're just endothelial cells kind of sitting on the liver parenchyma, and so viruses can pass out. It's more of a sinusoid than a blood vessel, actually. And so viruses can easily get into the liver. And often that's the first place viruses go when they're in the bloodstream. And many of them get cleared there. Fortunately, not all of them can replicate uh, in the liver. So in the brain, even though we have this wonderful barrier against infection, and we need that because the brain doesn't have a great immune system. It doesn't want to because if you get immune responses in the brain, your brain swells, you get encephalitis. This is bad. So the brain is a kind of immune-privileged place, and it's built a barrier to prevent most viruses from getting in. Most viruses do not enter the brain. But when uh, those that do can get across capillaries in a number of ways. So this is a capillary with the tight junctions among the endothelial cells and the basement membrane. Uh, some viruses actually infect the endothelium and can get across. That causes inflammation. They can get across the basement membrane. Yeah, these, these endothelial cells carry out transcytosis. They take up material from the lumen and deposit it on the other side, so some viruses go through that way, get into the surrounding tissues. And, you know, cells, lymph cell, uh, lymphocytes and macrophages can get through these tight junctions. They're really good at doing that, and vi some viruses take a ride in them. HIV, for example, is one that, that uh, moves across the blood in T cells. So a number of viruses have evolved to be able to do this. So we've talked about ways of getting in the brain. One way is viruses getting in the brain, of course. Uh, by nerve traffic, and the other is through blood vessels. They can, be, they can be meningeal blood vessels and cerebral blood vessels. And again, not every virus can do that. 
or they can be from blood vessels in the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus is the part of the brain that produces the cerebrospinal fluid, and the cells lining the choroid plexus are more permeable than in other parts of the brain. So viruses can get into the CSF at the choroid plexus, and from there then they can get into other parts of the brain as well. So even though the brain is pretty well protected against virus infections, there are a handful that get in uh, through some of these routes. So let's now talk about what happens once the virus has gone from, say, the blood or a nerve into a tissue. What determines whether it replicates or not? Not all viruses, as I said, replicate everywhere. And the distribution of replication sites is what we call tissue tropism, spectrum of tissues infected by a virus. And we talk about enterotropic viruses that replicate in the gut, neurotropic viruses, hepatotropic. You know, you can take any tissue and make a tropic word out of it. Many viruses have limited tropism, a few are pantropic, and we want to know why. We want to know what limits virus replication to, to certain tissues because maybe we can take advantage of that. Maybe something is missing that the virus needs, and if so, we could antagonize that in another tissue. Or maybe um, there's an inhibitor of virus replication, and we could take advantage of that as a therapeutic. So a lot of people have been studying tropism for that reason. What are the, some of the determinants? Susceptibility, whether you have a receptor or not, makes a big difference in the, in the tropism of a virus. Permissivity also, the events that happen after a virus gets into a cell, that can govern tropism. The accessibility of certain tissues, not all tissues are accessible, even if the virus is in the blood. And immune defenses can also determine tropism. We'll talk about some examples of that later. But here's one that has to do with uh, the presence of an enzyme to cleave a viral protein. So here is he uh, influenza virus being produced in the respiratory epithelium. All right, so this is a respiratory pathogen. And this virus buds from the apical surface. And it has an HA protein on it, which needs to be cleaved so that it can fuse to the next cell that it infects. Remember. The cleavage is required to liberate the N-terminus of the fusion peptide so that when the virus gets in a cell and the pH drops in the endosome, the fusion peptide can go in the membrane. We talked, I know we talked about that a long time ago, but cleavage is essential for the fusion. The cleavage happens in the respiratory tract by a trypsin that is produced by club cells. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an enzyme that has functions in the immune response, but it happens to cleave the HA of influenza virus. So the virus, if it goes to your liver, it will enter a liver cell and, and produce more viruses, but those will not be, have their HA cleaved because there's no protease in the liver that will do this. So that limits the tropism of the virus to the respiratory tract. However, there are some strains of flu that are cleaved by a different protease. So the H5N1, the avian influenza viruses, which people are very scared of, these are bird viruses, but they infect people now and then, and they, they kill them. They have a high mortality rate. And the infection is, is broadly tropic. It doesn't restrict itself to the lung because the cleavage site of the fusion peptide in the HA has got extra amino acids that aren't present in other strains. It's, it's called a multi-basic cleavage site, which allows it to be cleaved by proteases that are ubiquitous, that are in every tissue. So this virus can go into your liver or your gut or your kidney and produce viruses and get cleaved. The cleavage occurs actually uh, in the Golgi uh, during production of the virus by these broadly, these broadly expressed proteases. So that's one of the reasons why H5N1 has such a broad tropism and why we worry about it, uh, why it's highly pathogenic, because it has these extra uh, basic amino acids at the cleavage site. So that's just one example of tropism. I think as we move on in this course, we'll, we'll have others as well. The next question is insertion of multiple basic amino acids to HA cleavage site allows influenza virus to infect many organs. This means that the what of the virus has changed. Susceptibility, club cell tryptase, permissivity, tropism, or all of the above. 93% of you answer D, which is correct. The insertion of multiple basic amino acids allows it to infect many organs. That means the tropism of the virus has changed. 
Is that the susceptibility, remember, has to do with binding to cell receptors. So um, it's not tryptase clara that is present only in the lung. And permissivity has to do with uh, events beyond um, receptor binding, which none of you selected anyway. So now we have looked at infection of our host in very broad ways. We've looked at pathways of entry and spread. Let's talk about transmission, because as I said at the beginning, in order for viruses to endure in their host, they have to transmit from one host to another. So that's what transmission means, the spread of infection from one host to another, and you need it to, you need it to, to have a chain of infection, as we call it, from one host to another. And there are two typical patterns that we recognize in transmission. The first is shown at the left where it's between hosts of the same species. So I'm using humans here from human to human. So the virus infects a human uh, and it's transmitted to another. So can you think of an infection that is spread this way? Rhinovirus. Sorry? Rhinovirus. Rhinovirus, exactly. So someone gave it to me. It's another human, not uh, a, a non-human, but a human. When it goes from saying a non-human to a human, do you know what that's called? A zoonosis, right. So human to human, influenza, HIV, papillomaviruses, okay. The other pattern is from a insect vector to a mammal in a cycle. So here we have a, a rodent, uh, has an infection that's picked up by a tick who spreads it to another rodent and so forth. And the ticks can spread it to their offspring transovarially as well. This could be a mosquito or a midge or a thrip or any of any other insects. Can you think of an infection of, so this rodent, it's not always rodents, it could be a human in there. Can you think of a human infection that is spread by an insect? West Nile. Yeah, West Nile. It's a mosquito spread vector. It is, as far as we know, it's picked up from a human and spread to another human. Sometimes the virus comes from an animal reservoir. It's picked up by an insect and spread to a human. That's okay. That would fit into this cycle as well. So two uh, basic cycles of infection. And we have terms for transmission as well. And they're all shown here. Horizontal, between members of the same species. So whoever gave me my rhinovirus infection. That was horizontal transmission and, and zoonosis is from a different species. Do you know any new zoonoses? Rabies. Yeah, rabies. Any other? Ebola. Yeah, Ebola is a zoonosis. We think it's a bat or a, uh, or a, a slaughtered animal of some kind. Okay, uh, the next two are good reasons not to get sick. <laughs> Iatrogenic is when a healthcare worker infects you. Your ophthalmologist puts a contaminated instrument on your eye and infects you, that's iatrogenic infection. Nosocomial, you get infected in the hospital. Any of you know an example, a very famous example of a recent nosocomial infection? Sorry? Uh, that's a bacteria, which is good. How about a virus? Yeah, where did that happen? Yeah, the nurses in one of them who's suing now because she didn't want to be infected. So that was a nosocomial infection. Uh, vertical transmission between parent and offspring. So this can happen at birth. The mother can be infected very commonly in utero. And at birth, the virus is transmitted to the baby. At HIV, that happens a lot. Or it can happen after birth. You know, Babies and their parents get close, they kiss, and they share fluids and so forth, and infections happen, herpes virus infections happen that way as well. And then we have germline transmission, <clears throat> transmitted as part of the genome. And uh, these are the proviruses that we talked about, the retroviral DNAs that are in there. We pass them on. Humans don't make viruses, of course, but other animals in the wild uh, do make viruses, and, and they pass them on, and their babies produce viruses and so forth. So those are the different... That's what we mean when we talk about transmission. In order for a transmission to occur, most of the time, but not all the time, you have to shed virus. And shedding means the <coughs> virus is, is going away from its original host. So respiratory shedding, you're coughing or sneezing or speaking, and the virus is, 
being shed in your fluids, your aerosols that you're producing, fecal shedding for viruses that replicate in the intestine, or viruses that cause rashes. There's virus on the skin and it can be shed to another person by contact. All right, so here we have our mucosal shedding, respiratory, feces, urine, and semen for uh, your genital tract uh, infections. Uh, and then we have skin lesions. But many viruses aren't transmitted any of these ways, as we talked about West Nile is picked up by an insect vector. So that's a virus in your blood, which is only in your blood. It's not elsewhere, so it can only be transmitted by a mosquito bite. Polio virus is in your blood, but it's not transmitted by that route. It's transmitted because it's shed uh, in the feces. And there's never been ev any evidence for polio transmission by mosquitoes, even though it's in your blood. We don't know why. It may not be enough virus there. There may be other reasons as well. Um, obviously, scratches or injuries uh, with contaminated material can spread virus that's in the blood. If you drug users will share needles that are contaminated, they can spread infections that way. So what else have we gone over in the blood? Insect vectors, germline transmission, vertical from uh, parent to child. That would involve shedding, uh, the virus coming out of the mother or the parent. And of course, transmitting viruses in the blood supply. So these are examples of viruses that don't have to actually be shed in order to be transmitted, right? But for all the others, which are probably the vast majority, you have to shed virus by one of these routes. And respiratory transmission is very common. We make aerosols when we cough or sneeze, but also when we talk. And this is quite well known that people make aerosols. Here's a picture of a young lady sneezing. And you know, it's illuminated from behind so you can see this. But nothing special was done. When you sneeze, you do the same thing, you know. And that's what I just heard on the subway today. Someone announced, please, if you sneeze, uh, cough into a tissue or into your arm. I've never heard that before, actually. But this is why, because <laughs> you're spreading lots of virus. Now, when you, if you're infected with flu or rhinovirus or adenovirus or any respiratory virus, these drops that you're expelling, each of them contains lots of virus particles. And the drops you make are different sizes. Some of them fall to the ground right away. They're really big, <laughs> really big drops. They fall right to the ground in front of you. So unless you're right in front of someone, you're not going to transmit the virus. However, if you are a physician working on a patient, you sneeze on them, you're going to transmit it, which is why you should wear a face mask, right? Some of the drops go a little further. That's, that's shown on this nice diagram here. So if you large infectious droplets, they fall down closely. Small infectious droplets can go a little farther. But the ones that really transmit substantially are these. Here they're called infectious droplet nuclei. I just call them an aerosol because they remain suspended. They can go, if I were talking, I am talking, my, my aerosols could go to the back of the room. Okay, and if I had measles, you could get measles in the back there because that's how contagious it is. So these go long distances. So influenza is a big one transmitted this way, measles. Ebola is not transmitted this way. We're going to come back to this. This here, the red dots that go long distances, Ebola doesn't do that. As I said, Ebola is shed in respiratory secretions, and it could infect someone at close distance here if you make these large droplets. But for reasons we don't understand, it doesn't survive. In the, large, in the smaller droplets, maybe there's not enough virus. We don't know the reason. But this has been a big issue um, about people worrying about this, and it's, it's really not because it doesn't happen. So respiratory transmission involves these droplets of different times, but also uh, nasal secretions containing your hands and tissues. As I said earlier, rhinoviruses are typically transmitted by people touching their noses. They get a little mucus on their hands. <clears throat> My colleague at Columbia, doesn't shake anyone's hand anymore. He said he's cut his respiratory infections by 75%. All right, so if you go up to him, he just gives you this silly fist bump, right? And you could tell he's a microbiologist. <clears throat> so if you want to cut down, you don't shake people's hands, but that's another good way to transmit uh, respiratory infections. Just wanted to mention a little bit of information about uh, transmitting viruses from skin lesions. Uh, not all virus lesions are, are, are uh, infectious. But some are, and, and this, these are two stories out of Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. There's a wonderful uh, publication from the CDC that just reports on outbreaks of various sorts. 
Now, in this, in the world, smallpox has been eradicated since 1979, and we don't immunize any longer, but the military is immunized. In the U.S., we immunize our military. Can you guess why? Yeah, in case someone decides to use it as a bioweapon. And when you're immunized, you get a little, they take a needle and they scrape your skin, and the virus replicates and you get a blister. And on the top of this slide, you can see the development of that blister over time. And that shows you that the vaccination is taking because the virus is multiplying. So they put a big Band-Aid on here. And they tell you, don't take it off. And you should not contact people because there's virus being shed. Well, these, these are two cases where uh, there was transmission of the virus after sexual contact. So these military guys, right, they have their, their lesions shedding virus and then they have sex and I guess the band-aid falls off and their partner gets infected because mucosal layers are very susceptible to infection. All right, this virus is scraped into your skin to limit it there intentionally, but if you inhaled it, it would cause a ravaging lung infection and other mucosal membranes, urogenital mucosal membranes, which are what are involved here, uh, can get contaminated. So in these examples, this virus is shed from the skin, infects the urogenital tract, this happens all the time. You can search the literature and find it. So it's just an example of how virus can be transmitted from uh, a lesion that's, that's uh, shedding virus. All right, I think this is our last question. Which statement about uh, viral transmission is not correct? One, all virus infections are transmitted by shedding. Two, the route of transmission is determined by the site of virus shedding. Transmission is required to maintain a chain of infection. Speaking can produce an aerosol that can transmit infection. Horizontal transmission is among members of one species. So which one is wrong? All right, looks like you're all done. Yeah, 88% all, all of you answered A, all virus infections are transmitted by shedding. That's not correct. Remember, mosquito bites, the blood supply, um, vertical transmission, all examples of, not vertical, horizontal, sorry, not horizontal, um, germline, are examples of a virus that's not shed, but it can be transmitted. All right. Last issue I want to discuss, a general issue, is how infections are controlled by geography and season. Two different things. First, let's talk about how geography can restrict where a virus is. Not all infections are everywhere. Influenza is ubiquitous, but uh, many other viruses are localized to different parts of the world. Um, so why is that? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that um, the vector or animal reservoir may be restricted. So if the virus is transmitted by a mosquito, that mosquito may not be present in, in, a, in a cold climate, for example, and therefore you won't get the disease. If the virus goes from an animal to a human, then it will be difficult to get the disease. So right now, the vi Ebola viruses you know, go from some forest-infected animal to humans, and that has largely happened in Africa, although, of course, if you bring infected people elsewhere, you can get infections uh, in other areas, but most of the infections occur in Africa because that's where uh, the source of virus is. And I'm gonna use as an example of this chikungunya virus, how the vector, the mosquito vector, can affect uh, where the virus is. So chikungunya is a toga virus in the alpha virus genus. These are plus-stranded RNA viruses, they're enveloped, but they have a capsid, an icosahedral capsid. And they are spread by Aedes aegypti, this mosquito here uh, at the right. And this infection is typically not lethal, but you get fever and you get really painful joints. And, um, and this happens in many, many people, mostly up until recently uh, in Africa uh, and Asia. The virus was discovered in the 50s uh, in Tanzania, I believe and most of the outbreaks occurred uh, in Africa and Asia. There are millions and millions of people being affected. And interestingly, some of these people 
would have joint pains for years afterwards. We don't know why they're getting it initially. It's probably a consequence of inflammation, but many people have persisted, so it's somewhat debilitating. Never in the Western Hemisphere up until very recently. And the distribution probably explained in part by the, the mosquito vector. In 2004, outbreaks began to spread to other places. They, they originated, one outbreak in, in 2004 originated in Kenya and spread to India uh, through the uh, Indian Ocean Islands. And there's a, a French island here called Réunion. Almost half of the population were infected. It's only, the population is only 800,000, but still half of the population got infected with this virus that came from Kenya. And then the virus made its way uh, to Australia uh, and to Europe, first in Italy, and now in all these orange countries have experienced infections as well. So why is it spreading? Well, it turns out that these recent outbreaks in 2004 and subsequently are spread by a different mosquito, Aedes albopictus. That's this guy right here. And that mosquito wasn't transmitting before. This mosquito has a wider host range. The virus, it turns out, uh, underwent a single <coughs> amino acid change in the viral glycoprotein. So here we go with the viral glycoprotein on the surface responsible for attachment. One amino acid now lets the virus grow much better in Aedes albopictus, so this mosquito can now serve to transmit the virus. So the initial limitation of infection was a, a consequence of the vector Aedes aegypti, and now it's spreading beyond that because of this mosquito. This mosquito has been spreading globally for many years. This is the distribution on the upper left of Aedes albopictus uh, in 2000. Before, before the 2000s and late 90s, this virus wasn't even present in the U.S. It entered the U.S. in Houston on a uh, in a um, container ship full of used tires. Because the tires are full of water, you can't get it out. You can, no one's going to stand there and empty each tire. And if you do, it still accumulates on the way. And then the mosquitoes breed in these. So they, brought in, they were brought into Houston and have since spread uh, through the south and the southeast. Um, and uh, this is the case for many other countries as well. The, this mosquito is pretty hardy and it's traveling all over. And so that's why we have more uh, cases of chick. Here's the distribution of the, of the Aedes albopictus globally. So you can see seven years later, it's even spread further in the US. Uh, it's, it's not in Africa, but the disease was spread in Africa by Aedes uh, aegypti. Now we've had 45 chick infections in the US uh, in, the, in the last few years, and these states colored blue. Uh, these have all been imported. So people go elsewhere, they acquire infection. They come to the US in an incubation period, and then they get sick in the US and are diagnosed. So there's not been any spread from person to person in the US. I'm sure it's going to happen eventually as soon as we get a higher density of individuals infected. In Puerto Rico, in the US Virgin Islands, there has been local, have been locally transmitted cases, uh, 44 in Puerto Rico and one in the, in the Virgin Islands. So it's arrived in the Caribbean. It's an endogenous infection there now uh, as well. So the prediction is that eventually it's going to end up in the US as well. So it's a nice example of how this virus was not here before. It's here now, and it's because of the uh, mosquito vector. Many other similar examples as well. All right, last topic, seasonality. Most virus infections show a distinct seasonality. Three examples here. Rubella, this is, these are the 1960s. You can see peaks of rubella at certain times of year. Here, the, the numbers of cases are going down because they started using a vaccine, but you can see distinct seasonality. It doesn't occur all year. These are the number of cases on the Y versus the month of the year on the X axis. Influenza is absolutely seasonal in temperate climates. Uh, mostly from, uh, here in the U.S., for example, from uh, the fall into the spring, from about November into May or so, you see a very distinct peak every year. And in other times of the year, in the summer, there's no influenza, not, not epidemic. There may be a case here and there, but nothing like this. Even polio was seasonal when it was around in, the, in, in most of the world. Uh, in the northern hemisphere, here's Alaska. You can see it, it happened in the fall late summer, fall, and it moved, as you move south uh, by latitude, it, it moves to the appropriate part of the year as well. So distinct seasonality. For the most part, we really do not understand why these infections are seasonal. And there are probably multiple determinants. 
One may be the stability of the virus. So a virus that's seasonal in, in the winter, maybe it doesn't like hot climates and humidity and so forth. Uh, viruses that are seasonal in other climates may be similar reasons, but it can also be the host. We think that mucosal surfaces are very different in the winter versus the summer. In the winter, they tend to be thinner because the air is drier and we may have less resistance. You know, our hands may be cracked more in, in the winter than in other seasons. So that all these things may contribute, but we don't have any good evidence, with one exception, in it, which I'll show you in a moment, about what causes this uh, seasonality. This is an area really ripe uh, for investigation. A couple of years ago, a paper was published from, from Mount Sinai right here in New York City on influenza seasonality, and they use a guinea pig model. <clears throat> the problem with uh, models, animal models of influenza is they don't entirely mimic people. We cough and sneeze and expel virus. It turns out if you infect guinea pigs uh, with influenza, uh, they breathe and ex exhale an aerosol. So you can have it transmitted to other animals. So what they do is put guinea pigs in, a, in adjacent cages and they infect one and they can see aerosol transmission to animals in the adjacent cage. And in this study, they looked at the effect of temperature and relative humidity on aerosol transmission. So on this graph, we're looking at percent transmission on the y-axis and relative humidity on the x-axis. And the most informative, I think, is at five degrees. You know, it's chilly, it's winter temperature. At um, low relative humidity, so here's zero and 100%. Low relative humidity, the transmission is very high. But as you increase the relative humidity, the transmission goes down. So we know in the winter, the relative humidity is pretty low here. So that could explain uh, why the virus is transmitted better. And as it gets more humid, uh, if you, in this case, artificially increase humidity, you get less transmission. So that may explain why it doesn't transmit well in the summer. So they did another experiment at 20 degrees centigrade. You can see that the transmission is not as good. Uh, at low relative humidity, at 20 degrees, you get good transmission, but then it drops off rapidly. You get, a, you get this peak of transmission at about 80%. Uh, humidity, which they think has something to do with the kinds of particles that are formed. But then when you approach 100%, uh, 90% humidity, uh, the, the droplets, they, they hypothesize that the droplets get very big and they don't transmit through the air and that's why you get very low transmission. So maybe in the summer you have a higher temperature uh, and you get bigger droplets formed and also the virus isn't as stable at high humidity. So whether this applies to humans, we don't know. but it, you know, it could be that if you humidify your room, you would improve, uh, you would decrease transmission of the virus in your room, but eventually you're going to go into a lecture hall, which is dry, and so you're not going to be able to uh, affect transmission. So I think that's the best example of how we think uh, temperature and humidity and climate in general might control seasonality of infection.